the, uh, this interior is part of our Ukrainian project about the community policing, and now we had the opportunity to talk with Peter Torak, who has a lot of experience with uh, British local policing, and I would like to ask him shortly to introduce himself and to say something that led about his experience in Britain. Certainly. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Peter Torak, and um, I have um, I've lived in the UK for the last 17 years and 10 of those years I've worked for the British Police Force in Cambridgeshire. Um, I've started as a community police support officer, so that's a, a beat officer working in the local communities with no uh, weapons, no appointments, just really talk, to talk to people, that's the main purpose of the job. And then two years later I've joined the police force as a regular constable and I've been working since within the communities, um, engaging with, with uh, underrepresented communities and um, working with them on um, kind of promoting the police to them. Uh, let's talk about the community policing. As you probably know, the Ukrainian is on the beginning of all of this reforming of police forces. Uh, what is, in your point of view, the most important point is how to begin? How to begin with police reform? How to begin with new community policing, which in fact does not exist in Ukraine? I, I personally think that uh, the community policing, the, the, in, the, in the heart of the community policing, is the idea that, um, that, that we police by consent, by public consent. So we listen to people and uh, and get their opinions on what the police should do, what what is important to the people, because uh, you know regular people don't care about um, what is going on on international level. They care the most about uh, their house being burgled, their personal belongings, and their you know computers and these kind of things being stolen. So that's the most important to them. Sometimes even trivial matters, such like uh, people riding motorbikes, is more important to them than uh, terrorism on uh, international level. So the police needs to listen to th their views and deal with it. And uh, this all comes from... Um, you know, community policing didn't, didn't happen just on its own. It, it kind of was a long process. But uh, we believe that the community policing began with uh, Robert, Sir Robert Peel in uh, 1822 when he introduced nine Peelian principles. Um, and one of those principles, and actually I will read it because it's, it's very important, uh, the principle number seven is police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. And that's, that's the main idea of a community policing. But actually, this is the main problem in Ukraine, that there is a isolation. There is police on one side, society on one side, and trust of society to police is something about 3%. It means it's hard to say some advices what to do in, in, in now. Uh, but what we uh, see in Ukraine, uh, that there is a lot of voluntary forces, including the security, inclu including police forces, uh, which is uh, based on volunteers. Do you think that these people may be uh, the fundament for future police forces, these volunteers, without no experience in general uh, with uh, professional police work? The only people who are willing to be involved in this work? I think it, it is fundamental for gaining the public trust. And in the UK it works very well actually. Uh, we, we have got three types of police. We have got uh, community police officers, we have got police officers and then we have got special officers. And those special officers are volunteers that don't get a single penny for what they do. They do it because they like the job, because they want to get some experience, because they want to help people, or maybe because they want you know good thing on their CV when they go for another work. And it works perfectly. You know, these people go out to the public, they engage with members of public, and uh, they they show you know that they love the job even if the if, you know even though they don't, they get any money. So it works very well, and uh, the trust is built up much quicker and much easier this way. And uh, what about the relations between old professional police officers with these volunteers? Because sometimes in Ukraine we see that these relations are not so good. I think the 
important factor is that those volunteers, they have to be still very good trained. It's not good enough just to get out the uniform and just say, get on with it and go out. If they get proper training and if they know what they are doing, then that way they will be respected by the officers. So the special constables in, in Britain, they get the same training as police officers. So that way, police officers are actually very happy for them because, you know, we, we are in very, very difficult times in the UK as well. And we haven't got enough officers to do, to do the jobs. So by having the special constables there all the time available to us, we are very grateful for them. Um, a part of a uh, difficult history of Ukraine, there is, of course, a big problem with corruption. Um, you Maybe uh, we can uh, ask you uh, if there are some experience with uh, corruption in UK and if there are some cases of corruption, how these cases are solved or how to battle this problem? Mm -hmm. um, I think probably in 1970s, 80s, the, the government had decided uh, to deal with corruption because it was an issue as well. And they have um, given officers a lot more money and that way they have um, eliminated the, the problem with the corruption because obviously if they get decent wages, they don't have the tendencies to get a few pennies on the side from members of public. So the corruption is very low in, in the UK. And um, when it happens, it's dealt with very robustly. Not only that obviously the officer is straight away dismissed from the job, but also criminal investigation is taking place. The officer is named and shamed not only within the police, so everybody knows about him, but also in the public media, you know, in the newspaper, in the, on TV, so everybody knows, and then sent to prison. So they, they deal with those things very, very robustly. And do you have some personal experience you were offered uh, to take uh, some bribes? Yes, actually, and it's quite funny, actually. Um, because obviously, Czech, uh, any people from c Central and Eastern Europe, when they come to the UK, they still have this mentality that, oh, if I get stopped, I'll, I'll have a few and it's, you know, saved uh, just in case. Um, so once I was uh, stopped on the road, uh, on, on a footpath, I stopped a Polish guy on a bicycle. And it's an offence to, to cycle a bicycle on a footpath. So I stopped him and I said, sir, uh, I'll be issuing you a £30 uh, penalty ticket for cycling on the footpath. And he said, oh, if I give you 15 will you let me off? <laughs> I just had to laugh because, uh, you know, it's, it, it was the first time I've ever had it. And uh, he thought that he can get away with paying me half. So, no, obviously he didn't get away with, with it and he, he got a £30 ticket. Uh, actually, uh, we may return a little bit on the beginning uh, because uh, there is the idea in Ukraine and sometimes it's like happening that foreigners are included in, included in state administration to politics, to government. Uh, you as a foreigner, you were a foreigner in Britain on the beginning. How difficult it was for you to join the state authority uh, for someone who is a uh, migrant? I'm still foreigner in the UK. I still haven't got a British nationality, and that's the beauty of a British police. You know that you don't have to be British national. The only requirement there is for for foreign people is to live in the UK for three years. So um, obviously, when I've I always wanted to be a police officer, even in Czech Republic and then in the UK. And when I, I think uh, after about five years living in the UK, I've applied for, to be a police officer, and I, my application was rejected because of English. You have to have very good English. Um, that's the only and main requirement for foreign people. Um, so I've tried again after about another five years and then I was successful and I got in. So, um, so, so, so yeah, it, it, and, but it's not really a problem. If you speak good English and if you meet all the requirements, the police actually is very, very keen on recruiting people from ethnic minorities. And not only from ethnic minorities, but, but from LGBT, you know, lesbian, gays. Um, from um, Christian, Muslim, and all other religions, from all the strands mm -hmm. of minorities. So, yeah, and we actively go and we, for example, and that's part of the community policing as well, where we go to, let's say, mosques and do recruitment in mosques. We go to uh, places where we know that Somalian com community gathers and we go there to them and we do prom promotion about the job in there. We go to Roma Gypsy community and talk to them about joining the police. So it's a targeted recruitment from those groups. It's very interesting, I think for Ukraine it's a very interesting experience. Uh, it means that even citizenship is not, it's not necessary. No, it's not. Three years of residence. Uh, three years of residence. Uh, uh, let's talk about this topic, I think it's for Ukraine it's very interesting. Uh, uh, how to include 
uh, ethnic minorities and other minorities or even foreigners into a work for police because I think it may solve the problem or partly solve the problem with Ukraine with, with corruption for example because foreigners or Ukrainians who are working around the world uh, may go back home and to join the police for example mm. I think or for, for some of them it may be interesting offer uh, but definitely there are some problems uh, and you may maybe say uh, what was the main problems uh, with uh, including minorities into the uh, British police forces? Yeah, certainly. Um, I guess to start with um, the idea of uh, including uh, the minorities into the police job, um, I, I probably would be good to first mention the history, why actually the poli British police decided to do this. Um, obviously there were several incidents and uh, kind of a demonstrations in the UK that uh, affected policing. You know, like 1958, Nothing Hill race riot between the white British and Indian people. Uh, 1981, Brixton riot between black people and uh, the police, the Metropolitan Police. And then obviously 1993, the Stephen Lawrence murder. Um, and, and, you know, and obviously followed by McPherson's report. And all these incidents had uh, changed the face of policing and the police had realized that they could not do this on their own. They, they didn't know nothing about the black culture. They didn't know nothing about what they wanted you know, in their lives. And they couldn't engage with them properly because they had nobody in there. And, and that's not, obviously not only until then, but um, the police still is, majority of the police officers are white British men. And that's still the case. Uh, but obviously the police is aware of this and are trying now very hard to change this because they, you know, if you want to police the communities that you serve, you need to be, you need to fully represent the communities. And therefore the, the police and the Home Office come, came up with um, a project uh, called uh, BME Progression Programme 2018. So what it is, is that by 2018 they want to increase the representation of uh, black and minority ethnic groups. So. Um, it, it, currently, there are about 130,000 police officers in the UK. Out of those, it's only 5% of black and minority ethnics. So that's a very low number, obviously, uh, compared to the census data, where about 30% of the British population is black and minority ethnic. So that's obviously a big disproportionality. So, uh, and obviously, and most of those uh, ethnic officers are still in the constable level. You know, higher you go, less black and other ethnics you will find. So obviously now, we, you know, we, we actively go to communities and we try to persuade them to join the police, explain that the police is uh, fair and that we would treat everybody fairly and that it's good, uh, you know, opportunity to work and uh, good money and secure job. Um, but obviously there are sometimes an issues as well. Um, First issue is to gain, gain, to gain the trust within the communities. So let's say if you go to Somalian community to gain their trust to work for the police, where their experiences might be completely different from Somalia. Same with the Roma Gypsies, obviously, their experience very often is very negative with the police. And to now convince them that the police will look after them and after their children, you know, it's um, obviously very difficult. Same also then with um, once you recruit those people, very often we have got the uh, experience that those officers from minority groups suffer a lot. Not only that they suffer because obviously being the only, let's say, Pakistani woman in the police force, but also they suffer with their own community where they ha get threats from the local community. I, c I got threats from the gypsy community and um, they were very serious threats where they were t trying to pay somebody to kill me. So obviously all those things are extra pressure on, on, on the ethnic minorities. But it's really up to the management and up to the police force to, 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 to make sure that they come with this. You know. So my management was very helpful. They put uh, cameras in my house, they put alarm in my house, police officers walking around my house, and they were fully prepared for this. And they've challenged any kind of, kind of disorders, any uh, accusations or threats towards me and they and they help me always a, a lot so yes it's just not it's not really just okay we'll take loads of uh, foreigners into the job but you have to really make sure that you you will secure their welfare uh, okay we, we were talking about community policing which looks like a not so dangerous job in general and now you are talking about the gypsy mafia you have a problem with uh, maybe you can talk shortly about what's happened what's the reason and how it was all solved mm -hmm. 
Um, obviously, having officers from the ethnic minorities, and especially from those that are very underrepresented and very enclosed communities, you will get certain danger to, and, and certain threats towards those officers because they will be able to understand the language of the communities, they will understand the mentality of the community, and they will know individuals being involved in particular crimes. And if I talk about myself, uh, obviously when I started working for the police, I knew who is involved in drug dealing, who is involved in human trafficking. And because I'm very, I've always been very keen on t uh, tackling and investigating human trafficking. I brought to the police loads and loads of information when I've joined about the human traffickers. And um, suddenly those people w felt threatened because obviously me, myself, if it was not for me, the police wouldn't know that human trafficking is going on under their doorstep. So obviously f for those people I was a threat and they wanted to get rid of me and that was the reason. This was happening probably for about, I would say about a year, maybe two years, where first they were trying to make false accusations to get me rid of the, from the job. So they rang the police and said that I'm bribed, that I'm taking you know, money on site. Uh, this didn't work because the police said, you know, show us some proof and they disregarded it. Then they made more serious accusations that I'm raping small children, you know, very s stupid thing. But I, again, the police met with them and said, look, if you don't stop making false accusations, unless you have got some proof, you know, be quiet, otherwise we will arrest you for wasting police time. So very robust approach. And because they saw that they, this doesn't work, then they started with the threats towards my person. Uh, but police, again, t taken this very seriously, secured my well-being, you know, investigated those that were making the threats. And the, those people then realized that nothing works, so they decided actually to move out from Peterborough and, um, and leave me alone and to do their businesses either elsewhere in a different city or maybe even outside the UK. So that was the, the approach. It means, and in this example, this is an excellent exp ex example, that the community policing actually is very broad activities on many levels and it may help with investigation of very serious crime even sometimes with intelligence activities uh, and many problems may be solved on the very beginning. Uh, that's why uh, for someone who is on the very beginning of building some kind of community policing it would be interesting uh, to say them how normal, how your normal day look like, how uh, everyday uh, work of officer who is involved in community policing look like, that, let's say from the morning to the evening, what's your normal, uh, regular uh, day? Okay, I will, I will speak on, uh, like, um, I, will, uh, I will take it from a different approach, um, because obviously I've taken different roles throughout those years, and uh, each role has got different specific kind of uh, day duties. So, first of all, when I started as a police community support officer, my day looked like I came to work, I looked on the computer what happened over the night and then I left the station and went to local shops just to say hi, how are you, just uh, has anything happened you know, in the past few days. I've gone to local schools to, to, to speak to children, um, I've, I've walked on the street and uh, stopped a few people you know, cycling on the footpath, uh, you know, dan uh, dangerous driving or dangerous parking I've dealt with. And that was the most, of the, about 70-80% of the day I've, I've spent on the streets and talking to people. Um, I've gone to local parks after school and uh, spoken to children that were maybe smoking, you know, and told them off, taking their details to speak to their parents. So that was my main duty. And then I came back to the station about an hour before the end of the duty and I've placed everything, you know, all the intelligence and all the information I put on the computer, submitted all the forms and left the duty. As a community support officer, you know, you don't get any, any appointments, any weapons. You, the only thing that you will get is a pen and paper. You know, that's, that's all you need for, for your job. And that, was, and that worked very good. When I joined the police um, and I was a reactive officer, you know, so like the uh, response officer, my day looked like the way that um, I came to work, looked on our briefing and tasking note where we could see what had happened over the night, uh, who was arrested, who was wanted, and uh, then I left the station and uh, responded to calls for service. So, you know, over the radio they would say, okay, we have got a burglary coming, can you please attend? So I would go, I would take in the necessary paperwork and we would deal for, for, with everything from A to Z. So if they would send me to a shop where there was a shoplifter, I would arrest the person, take him to the police station, 
uh, search him, leave him in there. Then I would come back to the store, take a statement, come back to the police station, do the interview with the suspect, and then complete the file and send it to court. So we would do really from A to the complete investigation. Um, now I'm working on a human trafficking uh, team and my main role is uh, prostitution. Um, and my day look like, um, very, very, my main role is actually to take care of, uh, of the sex workers. So my normal duty is I come back, to, I come to the station in the morning, look through some intelligence, and then I go out and visit, visit various brothels, speak to the prostitutes, uh, talk to them about uh, their panthers, you know, how many clients they saw, um, you know, if they've been assaulted or if they have been given any information about underage girls, you know, or about any girls being trafficked. Um, so very, very friendly approach. Uh, in, you know, with the aim to get more intelligence from them and to show them that they can trust us. And we get really so much more, you know, with the prostitutes now, they report to us, um, you know, everything that they, they is concerning them. And we are not there just as a police officers. We, like, like last week, I've helped some of the prostitutes that don't speak English with English classes. So it's, it's really just full service where we can kind of show them that we are there to secure their well-being and then that they can talk to us about anything they want. Uh, it means that people in the era you are working on, they know they know you personally. They you know you know they know your name, they know your phone number. They can call you in every moment. If they yes, with the Czech and Slovak community, yeah, that's the case. Um, I would say I, I'm quite confident to say that probably 80, 90 percent of the community have got my number, if not the number they can contact me on Facebook and they do, sometimes even 3 o'clock in the morning if there's a fight in the pub they call me, oh you know we need your help, you know we need your advice so yeah, I, I, I think I'm very approachable, people know where to find me if they need me And even during the night, if you are not working, you are going to the pub to solve the problem? No, um, no I, I wouldn't be able to because of my job wouldn't allow me but I, from there I'm at least get, able to give them the, the answer that they need either I'll tell them look if you've been assaulted uh, you need to call 999 and get the officers there if uh, if not or if you've seen something I will come to see you in the morning or if your child gone missing you know you need to do this and this so I'll give them an advice I'm not going there personally as everywhere uh, probably there are some problems uh, with uh, work with the organization of police work Maybe there are needs and to, to do some changes, it would be good for us if you may share this experience uh, with our Ukrainian colleagues. Mm -hmm. I think, to my mind, comes to two things that I think will soon have, be, have to be changed, otherwise um, there will be serious consequences. One, one of those things is, <clears throat> is the approach. Obviously, with the new migrants and migrants, uh, immigrants coming to the UK, um, the police will have to adapt to this and will have to change their approach. Until now, obviously, officers don't carry any, anything apart of their, uh, like a spray, you know, the uh, incapacitant spray and uh, button. Mm. Um, with obviously now with the culture coming from, East, especially from Eastern Europe and f also from Arabic states, you know, th this is um, very often, you know, it's a kind of uh, quite common to have a knife on, on, on person. And um, we can see increased knife crime, in, especially in London and other parts of the UK. And I think the police will have to, just, you know, soon change their approach towards, uh, you know, these kind of crimes and maybe adopt uh, at least a taser, mm. you know, because for now officers, you know, don't carry guns, you know, nothing like this. But I think very soon it, it will have to it will have to happen. Um, second thing that I think uh, will have to change, and it's um, the police very often is kind of thinking we know it all. And we, we, you know, we can teach, but we don't need to learn. And I think that's a big mistake, especially when it comes to drugs scene. Um, in the UK, there's a huge influx, especially now for, with private inf coming from the Czech Republic, from Germany, by Vietnamese people, by Czech people. And it's huge and it's damaging, you know, the Czech and Slovak youngsters. Plus so many of them are on drugs and it's alarming. And I've been talking to my bosses for the last five years. I've taken one supervisor to the Czech Republic to meet with the narcotics team here. But they still think, oh, it's, it's probably nothing, you know. And uh, they don't take this very seriously. And I think if they don't, uh, very soon it will get out of the hands. So these things will have to change. Uh, yes, and uh, actually, um, let's back to the Arabs. It has some historical reasons why British police do not 
have a guns on service? Yeah, from my understanding, I think it was 70s or in 80s, uh, 1980s, um, there was an incident where somebody shot lots of children at school. And from there, I think it was Margaret Thatcher actually uh, prohibited the use of uh, short guns. And only uh, farmers are allowed to have uh, long barrel uh, guns. Um, but fully you know, licensed and managed you know, by lots of uh, regulations. But short guns are completely prohibited all over the UK. Yeah, especially because for Ukraine it's hard to imagine how would police work without guns in the street. <laughs> you see, that, and that, that's the thing, you know, like uh, I've been in a job for 10 years and only once I've used my incapacitant spray. Mm -hmm. And only once, you know, and uh, so, and I had people coming up with knives on me. So I think you can police without a gun, you know, and uh, lots of my Czech colleagues in the police say that uh, they, pr they probably could manage without a gun as well. Sometimes the gun is even a burden to them, you know, so. It's quite interesting. Uh, and it's obvious that there is need some broader cooperation with other agencies in the UK. Uh, may you shortly describe how it's work with your Cambridge police and uh, its relations to, for example, National Criminal Agency? Um, obviously in the UK there are 43 police, uh, police constabularies. Um, and then on top of those, the, there are national agencies such as the NCA, National Crime Agency, or, and, or, and many other law enforcement agencies. Um, so, uh, yeah, there is, there is a cooperation, especially when it comes to cooperation between the individual constabularies, there, there is very strong partnership. And actually now, because of the times of austerity, the, age, uh, the constabularies are working together now. So, the, for example, Cambridgeshire is merging with uh, Hertfordshire, and Bedfordshire, so we will have one call centre, we will have one firearms unit, we will have one dock section. So we are trying to merge and cooperate together. When it comes to more serious crimes, like we had uh, this year in April, we were investigating Slovakian Roma Gypsies uh, human trafficker team. And we were working in partnership with uh, Europol, Interpol, National Crime Agency and Slovakian government as well. So the cooperation is very strong. Uh, Obviously, it doesn't happen always. You know, sometimes we we have got our issues as well to share details with uh, with the bigger national agencies. But generally speaking, I think yes, uh, the cooperation is very good. You know, when it comes to immigration, so I can give you an example. Now I'm working uh, for a partnership team, and that's quite unique and uh, one of very few in the UK. It's a proper partnership working in Peterborough, where we have got in one office we have got immigration housing team, tax office, fire service, the police, intelligence department, and youth services. And I could name really quite, you know, like a t uh, benefit services. All those people, all those representatives from those, uh, you know, organizations working in one office. So instead of making phone calls, emails, letters, we, I just walk across the, you know, next table and speak to them about, okay, I've got this family. What do you know about housing? Do, who is he renting from? Okay, is he getting any benefits? Is he paying any tax? Is he sending children to school? And f suddenly we get full picture about one particular family. Works absolutely brilliant. As we were talking about Ukraine and about minorities, uh, you may say something about the Ukrainians in Cambridge. Uh, I do you have some Ukrainian victims of human trafficking, for example? or you have you got some experience with Ukrainian criminal groups? Uh, obviously because Ukraine is not uh, you know, allowed to come without visa to the UK, there are only very, very few Ukrainian people. And then normally when they come to the UK, they come on uh, maybe a Latvian, Lithuanian passport. Um, so I've met only very few, but um, I've met probably four so far. All four were in a criminal group from London involved in human trafficking. I, we said that guns are uh, not so important, uh, but technology is definitely today very important. Uh, may you say how, how which technology you use uh, daily, so. as well as PC cars and things like that? Okay. Um, yes, obviously, police is, uh, and, and it's very important for police to keep up with the criminals. Criminals in these days don't don't fight always with guns. You know, they they use smarter ways of committing crime, 
to, and most of the crime actually is happening in cyber crime today. So we have to be prepared and uh, our chief constable, the police president, is um, very keen on uh, you know, being actually a step ahead before the criminals. So obviously in terms of uh, vehicles, we have got a number of different vehicles uh, depending on the role. So response officers will drive normally uh, Hyundai i i30s. Um, you know, obviously good cars are very good, uh, you know, functioning cars. But when it goes up, you know, like the traffic officers, they will drive a BMW 5 or Volvo. Um, and the firearms officers will drive Audi uh, Q7s. So, but, but it's, it, this varies from force to force uh, and depending on local deals. But um, very, obviously, reliable cars, very good cars and um, um, obviously suitable for the, for the job that we do. When it comes to the older technology, um, I think, and especially in Cambridge, we are one of the best and um, you know, most forthcoming uh, forces in the UK. So every officer will get um, a personal phone, like a work phone for personal use, like those uh, smartphones. You can, you know, it's your phone, you take it home, you can use it for your personal phone calls, for internet, just anything. And, and obviously on your phone you can access any police database. You can search pictures of people that are wanted, you can go through the database of names, you can search intelligence, you can, uh, you can also attach a little device to it and scan fingerprints and uh, check if the person is wanted, if he's known to us. It means uh, you can work 24 hours a day if you want. Absolutely. That's, and and, and that's, that's, the pur that's the purpose, actually. Police is very clever about this, and they know that, obviously, very often, you know, if you don't finish you know, by 5 o'clock what you were doing, you will take it home and you will continue. And that's the, another reason why they gave us uh, the tablets, the slides. So every officer will get personally issued slide. It, it, you don't have to leave it obviously in the station. You take it home. You can use it for your personal use as well at home. But obviously at the same time you do everything on it. What the advantage of this is even now we have to. We are in very difficult financial situation in the UK, and po our police force in Cambridge needs to save four million pounds within five years. So it's a huge lumps of summer, money. But our chief constable decided that this would be the best way. And even obviously he spent loads and lots of money on purchasing. I don't know how many thousands of those for every officer in the UK in, in Cambridge, but still he knows that in long term he will save lots of money. Officers in these days don't have to go to the station. Actually, they are prohibited to go to station at most of the time. So they can only go there for maybe first and last half an hour of their duty to ch to put uniform and then to take it off. But uh, so today it looks like you go to work, uh, you log in, uh, and you go maybe to McDonald's or you go to Costa Coffee. You sit down, you log in to their Wi-Fi and you can check whatever you do. If you need to take a statement, you know, yourself, you go to McDonald's, you know, have a nap, you know, you've got your, 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 your lunch, and you do your statement on, on your slide. Sometimes we see at the very beginning, people were, oh, you know, look, and they were taking pictures, oh, he's sitting in McDonald's for an hour. But it's actually agile working, you know, people can approach me at any time, talk to me, and I'll talk to them, I'll stop this, and I'll talk to them about their problems. Um, the another benefit is we go to job, let's say, um, Two weeks ago, I had a, an assault on a prostitute. I gone to the job with my slate. I've taken the, in, uh, the the statement from the lady. I've taken with this the pictures of, of her injuries. Send it off to whoever needs it. I've um, also signed exhibit labels on this. Completed the doctor's consent forms. Everything completed within this, and then just one click, and then everything gone onto the criminal justice unit uh, that proceed to, that will proceed this to the court. You know, so everything is finish, you know, on this, no need to, to pay, you know, obviously there's a paper as well saved because everything is on the computer, even the signatures are electronically. So th that's, that's obviously a huge advantage. The maps are on this, um, your pocket notebook, you know, where you keep all the notes who have, uh, you know, you have arrested and what you have seen and what you have done is all kept in there. Uh, when you stop and search somebody, obviously every person that is stopped and searched has to be given like a the opportunity to get the details, like why he was stopped and searched. So we can record this on, on here and we can send the phone to them by email as well. So there are just so many benefits that we have got available. Talking about the technology, we should talk about the social networks as well. As you said, you have Facebook and you are working with this. How in general it works uh, based on your experience, social networks and the community policing and police work in general? Yes, obviously, to be able to keep up with the criminals, and, you know, we have to obviously realize that social media play a very massive role in these days. 
And um, so the police is able, obviously, to use to a certain extent the Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, many other social networks uh, for tackling crime, for investigating, for looking for maybe missing people. So obviously, you know, we can only search what is available to the public domain. Uh, obviously, anything extra, we would have to we would have to go through the USA headquarters of Facebook. Uh, but yeah, obviously we are able to search and we utilize Facebook and other social media for our purpose as well. So we have got a police Facebook page where we can put things that are happening. So anytime we arrest or prosecute somebody at court and very successful story, we will put his picture of the offender on Facebook and we will put what had happened to him, what, where he was stealing, what he was stealing. So we can kind of, not only that we will reassure the public, but we also those criminals that are thinking about or doing the same, we will actually warn them that we will be on their case. And if you are using your personal site on Facebook, are there some regulations what you may do uh, or you may not do? When it comes to using personal Facebook uh, profile, we are very limited what we can do with it because um, it's personal and obviously if we go onto somebody's profile, this could be traced back and if it's a cri high profile criminal, he can trace me back by my IP address. So we are very limited and obviously very war we are warned as well not to use it for high profile stuff even we are prohibited by our job to put any data, you know, even the fact that we work for the police, we, we are not allowed to put on our Facebook pictures of us being in uniform, not allowed as well. You know, things like, okay, I'm now sitting in a police uh, van uh, going to a football match, you know, to police, not allowed as well, you know, because all these things could be used by criminals to kind of think ahead what they are going to do. Um, so we, we will use normally a police f Facebook that we have got, like a police a public Facebook profile that, uh, that we use for a public kind of, uh, you know, uh, contact. But this uh, Facebook and other social media may be definitely used like a good instrument for community policing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have... Yeah, absolutely. It's um, obviously a a any, anything that happens in the community we will put on the social media if we are, uh, you know, organizing like a, we had a recently action day for uh, like a for ch small children where we invited the police and and the fire service. This went on there as well. So, you know, obviously we have to realize that most of the youngsters will use social media in these days. So that's why we we are very keen on utilizing it. As uh, we yep. said, the fundament for good local policing and good community policing it is necessary good relations between society and the police. And there is, in my view, a good example in Britain that there is a police officers who are working only with children. Uh, it's a full-time job in schools and it's from the very beginning uh, school, people in a school and especially children have access to police officers they may work with. They may, deal, they may solve the problems with him. Uh, I think it's a good example not just for Ukraine, but for all the other countries as well. I think it's the one of the topics we may uh, we, we should talk about as well. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely agree. You know that uh, it's very very important to start with uh, with the very early ages. You know with the children to to break those barriers and to show them that the police officers are not a repressive kind of. Um, persons that will kind of just be there to arrest you if you are naughty, as very often the parents will say to them. But um, so in many of the big schools, there are police officers and it's their full-time job. They don't do anything else. They just work within the school and they deal with anything that is there. So they, they do the proactive work. They go to classroom. They speak to children about danger of drugs, about the cyber, uh, you know, um, Cyber crime and, and and many other aspects of and even about the terrorism, you know, that lots of and lots of intelligence being gained through the children about uh, terrorism, you know, and um, so that's yeah, so that's that's engagement, that's the intelligence gathering, but also obviously dealing with the problems in the school. So if there is a child that is sexually uh, being exploited or abused, if there's if there are fights, if there's a child uh, not very you know well looking, you know, maybe malnutrition, nutrition. You know, not um, obviously being looked after very well. So all those things are being dealt with in the school and the, the children know the officer by name. So they've got this personal relationship with the officer. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, even when they leave the school, they know that they don't have to be worried about approaching police officer. Talking about children, it's as well about cyber crime, about cyber bullying, about difference, uh, how to get the narcotics. 
Uh, do you see on your personal experience uh, these negative issues in uh, work with children, for example, your some of your colleagues? Personally, I don't. But uh, yes, my colleagues uh, have have told me about their experiences, about uh, especially about cyberbullying when it comes to schools. Uh, and I sit right next to a sergeant that is overlooking the safer school offices. And she speaks very often about cyberbullying being a very big issue, especially on social media and various chat rooms, uh, you know, that, is, that can be used for bullying. Um, but this then leads to, obviously, the cybercrime, um, and obviously very well known, the dark net, uh, dark web, um, where people could buy weapons, narcotics, and all, all the you know, illegal stuff online. And this website has obviously been shut very recently, but um, you know, we know for, for a fact that there are many new websites that offer the same services. So it, it is a huge issue, but uh, only by the way of uh, specializing on, uh, you know, on offices that uh, and developing those offices to know what what it is about, we can obviously be able to tackle it. So just an example: one officer went this year, I think in March or uh, April, went to Dubai to learn about the cyber crime and how to tackle this. Mm. If we are talking about all of these issues, it looks we are still in office. It means you are still on in work, still in duty. It means how people behave differently if you are walking in form in school, on streets, on everywhere, or if you are without uniform, uh, just having a coffee with them. I think that's that's the main kind of uh, one of the main. Uh, aspects of a community policing and on approach towards you know policing by consent is that the officer is not is always an officer is 24/7 a police officer even if he's on duty you know because obviously if you know if you work for the police you have to represent the police all the time and once people know you being the police officer you have to behave um, even though you are not at work very often we work in plain clothes so what would be the difference between me wor working in plain clothes and representing the, the constabulary or being in my own kind of off time in my own clothes and people wouldn't know obviously the difference so yes um, if we obviously breach those if we you know if we make a silly comments on facebook or if we say stupid things in a pub with a friends all those things could be uh, could be leading towards dismissal from the job because you still represent the police. You are still the cop. In yep. Facebook, on the street, without war, without uniform. Once a cop, always cop. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. And I hope next time we will see in Ukraine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Cheers.